All right. Uh, so it's just about six o'clock. So good evening, everybody. We're going to get right into it. I'm Brady Newbill at the Museum of Discovery and Science. And welcome to uh, what I guess we can call our season finale of our Save Our Seas Distinguished Speaker Series. Uh, uh, current center here at the Museum of Discovery and Science uh, with the support of the Save Our Seas Foundation. Uh, we have a great program lined up for tonight. Uh, before we get started, I uh, just want to go over a few rules just for those of you uh, who haven't been to one of these events and refresher for those of you who have. Uh, I'm keeping everybody's microphones muted except for myself and the presenter just to cut out any uh, background interference or noise uh, so we can all direct our uh, attention to our guests tonight. Uh, you can keep your cameras on and off uh, as comfortable. Uh, and if you have any questions at any point during uh, the presentation uh, or later during the Q&A, uh, you can put them in the chat. At any point an idea comes to you, just put them in uh, the little chat box. Uh, if you don't know what that is, at the bottom of your screen, there's a little icon that says chat. Just open it up, type in whatever question. We'll come around uh, to the questions at the end uh, and have a little session there. Uh, so again, uh, presentation, and then we'll come back to uh, a Q&A session at the end. But you can put your questions in the chat at any point. Uh, we're going to be talking about sea turtles tonight. Uh, we just wrapped up our uh, sea turtle nesting season at the end of October here in South Florida. And we are joined once again by our good friend, Dr. Derek Burkholder, uh, who originally uh, comes from the great land of Michigan. <laughs> and uh, got his start in the field at the legendary Moat Marine Lab in the Florida Keys, got his PhD from FIU and spawned out to a uh, like marine science empire here in South Florida. <laughs> He's a research scientist at the Guy Harvey Institute at Nova Southeastern University, uh, director of the Broward County Sea Turtle Conservation Program, and director of the Marine Ed Environmental Education Center uh, in Hollywood Beach. Uh, great resources for the community. And uh, I also, I think he's a, he doesn't want me to tell you this. I think he's a member of the Justice League, uh, the Jedi <laughs> Council. And I'm pretty sure I saw him in the control room in that new Beatles documentary too. I don't know <laughs> where he gets his work done, uh, but uh, impressive resume uh, and excited to have him back. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Derek Burkholder. Uh, let's see if we can get this started. All right, here we go. Uh, welcome again. All right, thank you, Brady, and uh, thank you all very much for coming out tonight. I'm very excited to talk to you. Uh, let me just give, a, give me a second to share my screen here. <clears throat> all right, hopefully that's working all right. That's good. Uh, perfect. So uh, yeah, so thank you, Brady, for the introduction. Um, I do try to keep fairly busy. You can see there's a couple of logos here. I'm uh, involved with a number of different organizations. Uh, within Nova Southeast University and, and outside of that as well. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the sea turtle, um, not only the nesting season, but also kind of what the Broward County Sea Turtle Conservation Program does, um, why we care about our sea turtles here in South Florida, and a little bit about some of the research that we are very excited to be um, you know, conducting here um, on our beaches and in our waters right here off of you know, Fort Lauderdale. So just to kick it off, um, as Brady said, um, I am fortunate to work at the um, with NSU uh, at the Helmholtz College of Arts and Sciences, um, and there I'm with a number of different research groups. I'm a research scientist with the Guy Harvey Research Institute and the Save Our Sea Shark Center, and today I'm going to talk to you a little bit more from the sea turtle side of things um, and working with the Broward County Sea Turtle Conservation Program as well as the Marine Environmental Education Center at the Carpenter House here in Hollywood. Um, so to start off just a little bit, sort of the, um, so the education side of it, uh, the Marine Environmental Education Center is a uh, partnership that was born between um, Broward County Parks Department and Nova Southeast University. Uh, the center is actually located at um, a historic home in Hollywood Beach called the Carpenter House. Uh, it was a family owned home. Uh, the Carpenter family lived here for many, many years. It was built in 1941. Um, in 2001, June Carpenter, who was the last one here, passed away and left the, the property in a trust. Um, and the, the county purchased it, the Parks Department purchased it. And um, it was designated as a historic home, but also in, in, um, at that point was designated something that needed to be used for the community. So. Uh, a little bit later, they partnered with Nova Southeastern University and the MEEC or the Marine Environmental Education Center was born. 
Um, so the Meek is really, um, you know, like I said, housed at this beautiful property right here on the beach in Hollywood. Um, and <clears throat> normally we're open to the public Tuesdays through Saturday from 10 to 5. Um, we did close down for quite a while due to COVID. And right now we're closed because we've got some construction projects going on. Um, but we're looking in the new year to hopefully be back open and ready to go um, and welcoming people back to the center. Um, like I said, we're located on the beach, which is fantastic. And we've sort of converted the set space, um, talked about everything from sea turtles to marine debris, sharks, coral reefs, um, you know, seagrass beds. Um, and, you know, a lot of the programming that we do here is bringing kids into the center uh, to learn about sea turtles um, and, and sustainability, many of the different um, very important topics here in South Florida. Um, and of course, one of the stars of the show is going to be living in the family's old swimming pool. So we actually converted their saltwater pool into um, a habitat for a sea turtle. So we've got Captain the Green Sea Turtle here. Um, you can see we added a little bit of extra filtration to make sure that that pool is very healthy and a, a happy place for Captain to live. Um, and with that, Captain came to us um, in, 2000, in January of 2017. Uh, she was actually hit by a boat about 10 years ago now. Um, she went up to the Georgia Sea Turtle Center for several years where she was rehabbed to re you know, repair some of the cracks through her shell and some of the damage that happened from being hit by that boat. Um, she was released. Um, they had put tags in her flippers so that they knew who she was. They released her, but unfortunately, about three weeks later, she washed back up on the beach. Many times, boat strike injuries like Captain had, um, they end up having a lot of floating issues where they get air trapped in the shell or in the tissues. And they have a hard time diving down into the water. And that's exactly what Captain has a problem with. And so now we're very fortunate to have Captain here at the Meek. Um, and like I said, in a couple of, you know, hopefully just a few more weeks, we'll be able to have people come back and visit Captain again, um, see her and all the other um, exhibits and things here at the center. Um, we host a lot of different beach cleanups, education days. Um, all these different kind of things right here on site. And so uh, we're very excited for 2022 to bring everybody back into the center and uh, have everybody meet Captain and visit again if you've been before. We actually opened in 2017. Um, and like I said, we, we do a lot of work with our local school groups um, and bring in kids to learn about all these different aspects of the marine environment here in South Florida. But tonight, we're going to talk a little bit more about our sea turtles. So worldwide, there's actually seven species of sea turtles. Um, five of those we get right here in South Florida. You can see on this, the top row here, the loggerhead green turtle and leatherbacks are all sea turtles that actually nest on our beaches. As Brady said at the beginning, we just finished up our nesting season. So that goes from March to the end of October each year. Um, and then we do have the Kemp's Ridley and Hawksbills that live on our reefs and in the waters just offshore here, but don't really come up on our beaches to nest. Um, so with turtle nesting, sea turtles obviously are born to live in the water. Um, and so one of the only times in their entire lives that they come out of the water are when the females are climbing up onto the beaches to lay nests. Um, they do that usually at night um, to be able to come up, hopefully not deal with quite all the, the nice hot, warm, you know, the hot sand and things during the day. Um, but they come up at night, lay their, their nests, head back into the water. Worldwide, sea turtles are struggling, unfortunately. Um, all species, all seven species of sea turtles are threatened or endangered worldwide, unfortunately, mostly due to human impacts. Um, they are both federally and state protected species. And there are many, many different levels of conservation efforts going in to help protect these animals. Everything from the nesting surveys that we're going to talk about today to rehabilitation centers where we got Captain from after she'd been, um, you know, healed up and things up at the Georgia Sea Turtle Center. Um, everything from stranding response to help deal with those injured animals, education and different um, devices that are used in fisheries to hopefully lessen the impact of some of our fisheries worldwide. So there are a number of different threats to sea turtles. So one of them that we have, you know, that these animals deal with anywhere in the world is predation. So this is a natural threat um, for some of our, our little guys, we get predation on land where some of our foxes, 
Um, we'll actually eat eggs. We've got raccoons. You can see that one's a cute little raccoon, but it does unfortunately have a sea turtle egg in its hands there. Um, crabs can actually have an impact on these animals. Uh, the hatchlings as they're trying to head down to the water. Ghost crabs, other pets, shorebirds, all these kinds of things can have a pretty big impact on these um, little guys on land. At sea, the hatchlings again are dealing with birds. We've got fish, things like mahi, um, can unfortunately eat quite a bit of these guys. Um, so they really do face a lot of different threats as they're cruising around. As far as when they get to an adult size, usually what they're dealing with is gonna be larger things like sharks, um, or there's very few predators that can go after an adult sea turtle of any of the species, other than some of these really big shark species. So there are a few of these natural um, impacts to our sea turtles, predation, but unfortunately, all of these other ones are tied back to humans. So everything from coastal development, lighting, um, boat strikes, like captain unfortunately suffered, poaching, things like that. So just kind of go through this a little bit. Um, one of the biggest drivers for all of our species being in that threatened or endangered uh, status right now started off with a massive overharvesting. Um, sea turtles were a great source of food uh, when people started to arrive in, in the waters of the Caribbean and the, you know, in the United States. And these animals were taken by the thousands, tens of thousands as food sources for uh, the people on ships and things like that. Um, you know, there's been a lot of great protections. The Endangered Species Act went into effect in 1973, stopping all the uh, harming, killing, and harassment of sea turtles worldwide. Uh, the IUCN Red List, um, CITES to help protect against trade of endangered species, uh, conservation of migratory species and wild animals, conservation of these animals. So there's been a lot of great protections in place um, to help hopefully stem this a little bit. Um, but unfortunately, in some places around the world, we do still see things like poaching, people taking the eggs for food, again, taking the animals for food as well. We get, they get used for oil, leather, shells for decorations, their food. Um, you know, some species, the hawksbill in particular is one that's been taken um, and is still taken, unfortunately, for this beautiful, beautiful shell that they have. Um, it, it, you know, people make jewelry out of it, wall hangings, um, things like that. These are illegal to own, um, but unfortunately there are some places in the world still harvesting these animals to make these, um, you know, these decorative items. Another one and something that kind of strikes home right here in South Florida are things like coastal development. Um, so, you know, we all, obviously we all love to be near the beach. That's, that's why we're all here in South Florida. There's a lot of great opportunities, beautiful scenery, um, but unfortunately that can have impact on sea turtles as well as some of the other uh, native species here. So just to kind of put this in perspective, this is a photograph of Port Everglades in 1928. So right here in Fort Lauderdale, you can see not so many of those buildings around. We've got nice, big, wide, sandy beaches. Um, you can see that they're dredging there the port to come into Port Everglades to make it a little bit deeper for some of the bigger ships and things. So now if we fast forward, uh, this is what it looks like currently. You can see it's very, very different that we lost that really wide, expansive beach, especially on the south side, or sort of the left side of the picture here, as you go um, down from the, the port, uh, you can see that beach is very, very narrow now. And that's largely due to our impacts by building Port Everglades, by putting some of those big piers in place to stop the water flow, stop the sand moving down the beach. And this created this very, very different um, beach area. Um, so, you know, again, we all want to live near the beach, but to do that, we have to sort of manipulate things a little bit. We put, um, you know, structuring seawalls in place to try to stop sand in our buildings from falling into the water. Um, we've got things like these rock revetments to, again, try to break up movement of the sand. Um, we've got our piers. Again, this is a picture of Port Everglades. You can see the big difference from even the north side to the south side where that pier goes out and stops the sand flow, we get these big, uh, you know, very massive loss of the sand uh, south of the pier. Um, in general, beach erosion, you can see sand being washed away. This is a big impact and things like hurricanes and 
king tide events and things like that, where a lot of our, our sand might be washed away due to, due to heavy waves. Um, this can have a, a pretty heavy impact on our sea turtles. You can see right in the middle of this picture, all those white little uh, dots there, those are all sea turtle eggs. So what's happened is the waves have taken away the sand and exposed an egg chamber uh, where those eggs were incubating, getting ready to hatch, but they've been, that sand's been washed away. Ultimately, these eggs had to be relocated to hopefully protect a few of them and get them to hatch a little bit later. Um, light pollution, again, is another big impact here in South Florida. Uh, sea turtles in general are driven, um, you know, their, their nesting habitat, their, their nesting happens at night. They're hatching when they're coming out of the sand happens at night. And we're, for them to figure out where to go is driven by the light on the horizon. So that should be the sun and moon reflecting off the water, creating a nice bright horizon out over the water, and we'll pull them out towards the water. Unfortunately, things like um, street lights, buildings, things like that, that bright light, that street light might be much, much brighter than the moon and will cause those animals to go the wrong way. Um, that happens both with the mothers coming up to, to lay their eggs, as well as those hatchings trying to get to the water. They might spend a lot of time walking around, get exhausted trying to get back to the water and can really have a big impact on even how many nests are in, a, in an area because of that, that mom comes up, might, might get scared by all the bright lights and head back without laying a nest in that um, you know, bright area on the beach. We do see disorientation of these hatchlings and uh, the females and what I mean by that so normally what happens is again, those babies will come up to the surface. They wait for it, for the sun to go down, nice and cool at night. They're all gonna come out together and head down towards the water. On a good hatch out, one that doesn't have any impacts of lighting, this is, this is what it looks like. They all come out and head right down towards the water like we want to. Unfortunately, in areas with bad lighting, we see something like this, where these hatchlings come out and they just wander and wiggle and move and and circle around the beaches, sometimes for hours and hours and hours, going the wrong way, getting stuck in the dunes or up against the seawall, or even getting into the street and storm drains, people's pools, things like that, because they're headed to those bright lights um, shoreward instead of being able to go out to the water. Um, marine debris is another huge impact on, obviously, not only sea turtles, but all marine life. Things like nets in the water, they can become entangled in. Um, any plastic, plastic bags out in the water look a lot like jellyfish or some of the other things they might want to eat. Um, in some areas around the world, uh, we have something called the fibropapillomavirus. This is something where an animal gets these big tumors um, that form on their, usually on the soft tissues, on their neck, around their eyes, on their flippers, things like that. Um, and we think this is largely caused by maybe not very um, clean waters, things like that. But there's actually a lot of research going into the fibropapillomavirus uh, because we don't know 100% of where, you know, what causes this. Um, we, we see that a lot of times green turtles and a lot of times the smaller green turtles get a lot more of the, the FP or the fibropapilloma than some of the other species. But it, you know, it, it, it can be found in any of these guys. So it's something that has a pretty big impact. Um, they can have the tumors grow so big, they can even grow inside them so they can't eat after time and things like that. So um, boat traffic, again, just like Captain here at the Marine Environmental Education Center was struck by a boat. This can happen like this top picture here. You can see it might be just a, a blunt strike injury where maybe the hull, uh, you know, the bottom of the boat hit the turtle at high speed. Um, or it could even be hit by the prop where sort of this bottom middle photo, you can see the slashes. This would have been a very big prop, something maybe on like a, a cruise ship or a, a tanker or something like that, where a very large blade had actually sliced right through the shell um, and, and done damage to these animals. Um, on shore, we have some impacts as well. Things like beach furniture, um, you know, things like that that are left out overnight. In this case, this is a mom actually got stuck underneath this stack of chairs on the beach. We found her in the morning and actually had to remove those chairs, get her turned around. She was very exhausted because she'd been stuck fighting, trying to get out of that chair for a very long time. Um, in other cases, they kind of can mow right over. But unfortunately, you know, they, they might have turned around, got stuck in that on the way back as well. 
Um, fisheries is another big impact. So bycatch um, in generally in a fishery is something where we're catching an animal that we don't target. Um, so things like um, a tuna fishery. Tuna fishery sometimes will use a long line. So a pelagic long line might be thousands of hooks and miles and miles and miles of line with upwards of you know, 10,000 hooks dangling off of it. They're aiming for these tuna, but they might catch lots of other sharks or sea turtles or other animals, which is what we would call that bycatch because it's not the targeted species. Um, unfortunately, for something like a sea turtle that has to breathe air at the surface, if they get hooked on a, they get stuck on a hook below the surface, they may not be able to surface and they can drown and be dead when they get to, um, you know, the, the fishermen get back to that line. Another big impact or something called are, are these trawl nets. So in say like shrimp fisheries and things like that, a boat will drag a huge net behind them underwater. And again, for an animal like a sea turtle that has to breathe at the surface, if it gets pulled into that net, it isn't gonna be able to get up and get that breath. And so they can sometimes drown in those nets. There are some amazing tools called turtle excluder devices that have been put into play um, for the trawl fisheries. And it, what it does it has a big metal grate near the end of the net. Um, and what happens is those big animals like a turtle or even some of the big coral pieces that might get broken off or a dolphin or something that gets in there will hit that metal grate and get kicked out a little trap door at the top or the bottom of the net where all the shrimp that they're trying to catch goes through the metal grate and gets stuck in the back end of the net. This has greatly reduced the impacts on sea turtles, but it's still something that we want to work towards reducing even more. So with the Broward County Sea Turtle Conservation Program, um, sort of our program monitors the beaches of Broward about 24 miles um, every single day from March 1st to the end of October. Uh, we start about half an hour before sunrise. This work is funded by Broward County. Um, and conducted obviously by NSU and our staff here in South Florida. All the work for working with sea turtles is under Florida Fish and Wildlife uh, Conservation Commission marine turtle permits. Um, this is a lot, this is to ensure that um, the people working with these endangered species are trained properly and know what they're doing to be able to conduct this work. Um, all the information we collect is given to the, the county, the state, federal agencies to better monitor and manage the sea turtle populations here in South Florida. So what does a typical day look like? And again, we're just near the end, we've just finished up our season, but for the last eight months or so, every day our crew would start half an hour before sunrise, we'd go down to the beaches and we'd hop on an ATV, drive up and down the beach, those 24 miles, um, and we'd be looking for things like this. We're looking for crawls from where moms came up on the beach overnight to lay a nest. We can see where their, you know, their flippers kind of dug in. You can see this almost tractor tire pattern as they moved up the beach. You can see these big dug areas, these fluffy mounds where we, you know, with a trained eye, we can know that they've laid a nest or not um, and figure out what's been going on. In some cases, we something, see something like this. This is called a false crawl where the mom came out of the water and for whatever reason, maybe the sand wasn't good Maybe it was somebody running down the beach trying to take their picture in the middle of the night um, and yelling and screaming, scared the, the mom off, turned around, went right back into the water without digging a nest. Um, and hopefully she'll come up in, you know, a few hours later, maybe the next day and lay that nest in an area that is more suitable to what she's looking for. Uh, we will respond to those dead, sick and injured sea turtles if we find them on the beaches or if somebody calls us. Um, in some cases, we'll actually have to move some of these nests. In this particular case, this is actually Nova Southeastern University right here, they're our oceanographic center. Um, this is on a, a little tiny beach inside Port Everglades. And so this is an area that on the next tide, high tide, this nest is gonna be underwater, will be drowned and all those legs, eggs are gonna be lost. So what we do is we carefully will we'll dig those up, move them to a new safer location, dig a new nest that's exactly the same dimensions as what the mom laid and put those eggs back in the ground and have them incubate in a, in a more safe location. Um, in some areas where lighting is an issue, we've been putting these cages out for the last few years. We put these um, in an area where we know that the, the nest is, so when it hatches, the babies will come up and they'll be stuck in that cage rather than walking all over the beach or heading out to the the streets or something like that. And we check these several times throughout the night. Any babies, any hatchlings that are in there will be moved out and released back into the water. 
Um, and then of course we do sometimes get those stragglers or that we'll find in the morning. These guys we're going to hold for the day and release them after dark again um, when they would normally be heading down on their own. So again, like I said before, based on what we see, sort of the forensics on the beach in the morning, we can tell if it's a loggerhead sea turtle, a green sea turtle, leatherback sea turtle that laid that nest. We can get an idea of kind of what happened just by looking at what the mom did on the sand. Um, when we find those nests, we're going to mark them off. So if you go out during the summer, you'll see a lot of this pink flagging tape out there and these little yellow signs. Those are areas where we know that there's a nest. We put those out there so that people don't accidentally put their beach umbrella through there or the tractors cleaning the beaches don't run over them and dig up a nest or something like that. We monitor these nests throughout the entire season. And then we wait about two months later, we're looking for hatchings and something like this is going to happen. So when these babies are in the water, they are sorry, in the sand, um, they can be anywhere from a couple of feet to six or seven feet down. There might be anywhere from 80 to 120 eggs in that nest. They're all going to hatch at the same time. And they all sort of work together. They wiggle and move. The sand falls above them, goes down below them as they wiggle all together. And they have a little bit of a sand elevator that moves them up to the surface. Then they get right near the surface. And usually they come out at night and do this big run down to the water and head out to the ocean. We are very lucky a couple of years ago to have this morning hatch out. Just as our surveyor got there in the morning, we're able to see these guys popping out of the water and get this great little video here. Um, but what they do is they come out, they head down to the beach and they just start swimming. They move offshore. They swim for about 24 to you know, 72 hours. They swim straight offshore until they find a nice big spot of sargassum. They're gonna ride around for the next 10 to 15 years of their life. Uh, but back on the beach, three days after we see those hatch outs, we're going to go in and dig up that nest. For that, we want to know how many eggs were there, how many of them hatched, how many of them didn't hatch. And that we're just collecting data to try to figure out how successful these nests were um, here in Broward County. Um, we want to know, again, how successful it was for those animals that we left just where mom put it. Mom does know best, obviously. Uh, usually those nests, about 75 to 95% of the eggs are going to hatch and those hatchlings are going to leave the, um, leave the beach. Um, in an area, in, in a nest that has been relocated, so like that one that was in Port Everglades, uh, we might move that to a safer location. No matter how careful we are, how, no matter how good we are, just by moving those eggs around, we lose about that 15 to 20% um, of that nest is, is not going to be as successful as the one laid just by their mom. So, but we do want to collect all this data to know how they're doing. And then, of course, if we do find any stragglers, we're going to pick those up, hold them, and release them that evening. So, you know, these hatchlings are very, very cute. Uh, we have the loggerhead are our primary species here in South Florida. Um, the green turtles in size, the hatchling, they're a little bit bigger. They're much darker, and then this beautiful white line around the back and on their flippers. Then, of course, the leatherback is the largest species of sea turtles. These guys live primarily offshore as adults, can live, you know, can grow up to about seven feet long and weigh up to 1,500 to 2,000 pounds at their largest sizes. So they're much, much larger, but they get their name because they've got that leathery. They don't have a bony, hard uh, shell like the other species. They've got a more leathery back, and it, you do see, sort of see that striping down. Um, which makes them very distinctive out there in the wild. So we talked a little bit before about all the pressures and all the threats that these guys have. So how many of these guys are actually going to make it? Um, unfortunately, with those threats, only about one out of every 1,000 hatchlings that leaves the nest is going to make it to adulthood and come back to that area where it was born uh, for the females to lay their own eggs. And so that's why we put so much effort and so much work into protecting as many of these guys as we possibly can. <clears throat> so I will say, um, I'm very, very happy to say that these efforts are working. Um, we are seeing increases year to year um, in our nesting numbers. Um, in 2019, we've had, we had the highest amount of nesting that we've seen in the last 30 years of monitoring here in Broward County. Um, again, as I said before, loggerheads are the ones we get the most of here in South Florida. We had over 2,800 nests 
We had nearly 800 green turtles in 2019, 43 leatherbacks, a couple of them that we didn't know because we found them a little bit later, um, or the, the crawl was too messed up when we saw it to be able to determine what kind it was, with over 3,600 nests in um, the 2019 season. 2020, again, another good year, but we did expect it to be a little bit lower. The reason for that is the females, the moms that come here to nest, don't come back every single year. A, a single female will come and it might lay anywhere from three to 10, 11, even 12 nests over the course of a single season. They'll lay a bunch of eggs, go out for a couple of weeks, come back, lay another nest, go out for a couple of weeks and do that. So it's very, very costly to make all of these eggs and, and you know go through this nesting season. So they're gonna go away for one to three years, go back to their foraging grounds or feeding grounds, get, you know, build up those reserves and come back and start it all over again. So we see sort of an up and down year to year because those, those moms don't come back every year. So 2020, another good year, much, much higher than, you know, previous years, not quite a record, but still a very, very solid season. And then of course this year, again, not a full total number of, of um, number of nests, but we did have a very nice solid 2,500 loggerheads, almost 500 green turtles. But what we're very excited is we had over 80 leatherback nests. Um, this over doubles our previous record of Broward County for the last 30 years of monitoring. We had a one year where we had 46 leatherbacks, but this year it's almost doubled, sorry. But this year we had 83 leatherback nests here in South Florida, which is very, very cool to see. Um, obviously they are lowest nesters. So to see a big year like this um, is really exciting. And all of these, you know, we do see this up and down, but this up and down keeps going up and up and up and up um, as the years go by. So we're very excited to see over time, these populations starting to rebound. And what I think we're starting to see is really looking at the last 20 to 30 years of all of these different conservation measures all coming to fruition at the same time. Um, when a, when a baby leaves the nest, it takes 15 to 20 years before that female is going to come back to the beaches to lay her own eggs. And so we're starting to see the 30 years, 20 to 30 years ago, um, those animals we started protecting are starting to come back and those numbers are going up. So it's very, very exciting to see what's going on. Um, and so, you know, kind of another exciting thing that um, we've been working on the last few years here in Broward is starting to try to figure out what the moms are doing once they leave here in South Florida. So like I said, we've been monitoring the, 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 the beaches, looking at the nests, how many hatchlings there are, how many of them leave the beach, like that, things like that for the last 30 years. Um, but other than knowing what they've done on the beaches, we didn't really know where the moms are coming from. We know that they go away for a couple of years, um, but we don't know where they're going to feed. We don't know where, you know, how far they're traveling, things like that. So um, <clears throat> about four years ago, we started um, our sea turtle tracking project. Um, this picture at the bottom, this is Glenn Goodwin. Um, he's been a phenomenal um, team member both on the beach program, but he's also a PhD student here at NSU and has been leading the charge on our tagging program uh, here in Broward. And so for many months throughout the summer, he spends night after night after night going out there, getting to the beach about nine o'clock at night, driving or walking up and down the beaches, looking for moms coming up to nest. Um, and when, she, when he does find them, going to put them in a little box and is going to then attach some tags, collect some information about the turtles themselves. We want to know just basic information, what species they are. Are they, you know, loggerhead green turtles, how big they are. So we take a series of measurements on them. We take some tissue samples. So a little piece off their flipper. We take some blood samples. And with that, we're looking at things like genetics. Um, we want to see how um, this population of loggerheads and greens, um, you know, how, how far they're ranging and using those genetics, we can start to look at, you know, how, how they're connected within not only Florida, but the larger uh, sea turtle communities in this area and around the world. Um, with those tissue samples, we also look at things like their diet. And so by taking that little piece of tissue or a little bit of blood, uh, we can actually look at 
um, something called uh, stable isotopes, which is just looking at their tissue to try to get an idea of what they're feeding on. Um, so we can see if they're feeding in more of a seagrass food web, a algae food web, or something like that. But it can also tell us, um, in some cases, maybe where they've been traveling. Um, so the, the seagrasses in North Carolina have a very different signature than the seagrasses in South Florida. So when they leave here, by looking at their diets, we might be able to tell if, based on just what they're feeding on, if they are normally a North Carolina turtle that's come down here to nest, or what's going on. Um, another, the, the, you know, the very exciting part is also using things like these satellite tags. So this previous turtle, this was a loggerhead. These guys, they have, get their name because they've got this great big head on them, um, very strong bony head that they use to crush things like crabs and oysters and clams, these nice crunchy things. Um, we also are dealing with our, our green sea turtles. This is the largest of all the, the hard-shelled sea turtle species out there, and they're feeding mostly on seagrass and algaes. But by putting this little guy right here, this is called a satellite tag, we can actually start to track the movements of these animals over time. So this tag, we just glue it on the shell, so this doesn't hurt the animal at all as it's going on. But what it does is anytime this antenna that we see here on the top comes out of the water um, and the, the tag comes out of the water, which happens often because these guys do come up, you know, many, many times a day to breathe air at the surface. When we get that tag coming out of the water, it's going to ping a satellite and tell us where that turtle is anywhere in the world. Um, so with this, we can look at the longer term movements where these guys are moving after they leave our beaches. So. On shore, like I said, Glenn has been doing some amazing work going out there at night with his team, um, walking up and down, finding these turtles as they're coming out to nest, wait for them to nest. And as they're headed back to the water, we put that little box around them to be able to hold them for just a little while while we're collecting our samples, measurements, putting the tag on, and then we send them back into the water. Um, in other cases, we're, and actually right now, we're starting a lot more work in water. So we've started a project working in, in Biscayne Bay, um, working with USGS, Kristen Hart and her team at, at US Geological Survey. Um, and we are starting to work down there and working with animals in water. So you might wonder, how do we catch a sea turtle? Does it take a hook like a fish? Probably not very often. And we wouldn't really want to do that anyway. Um, would we want to use a big net? Again, maybe not the best way because these guys have to come to the surface. We want to make sure that we're not going to get them tangled in anything that they might have an issue. So one of the easiest, best ways that we've found to do this is something called the sea turtle rodeo. So what we do is we find a sea turtle swimming in the water. We give chase. When you get close enough, you jump off the front of a perfectly good boat, swim down, hopefully get a hand on that turtle, and hopefully get it up to the surface again. So we'll look at that one more time drive around, jump off the front of the boat, dive down, hopefully, again, hopefully get a hold on that, and hopefully get it up to the surface. Please remember, these turtles are made to swim in the water. I am not. So this doesn't always go nearly as well as this little video shows. Um, that's, you know, we drive, dive down, sometimes you get a good hold and you can get them up to the surface. Some of these animals are two, three, four hundred pounds, and so sometimes they don't go quite this well. But once we get them to the surface, we can actually bring them over to the, the boat, get them up on the boat and collect all that same information. Um, we are very, very close with the, the amazing support of some um, great people from the Extra Catch um, and some local families here that have actually put together a boat for the lab. And we're going to be doing some much more uh, expansive research, again, in Biscayne Bay, the Florida Keys, the Marquesas, out in the Dry Tortugas things like that to really start to look at our local uh, turtle populations here in South Florida. So what those satellite tags do, um, again, anytime that turtle comes up to the surface, it's gonna ping, tell us where that turtle is anywhere in the world. And over time, we can look at their movements. So this is a, um, a map that you can actually take a look at, or sorry, this is a sort of a compilation of a several different sea turtles. Um, what we found is all these animals that were started here in, um, you know, in the Fort Lauderdale area in, Bis in Broward County on their nesting grounds, what we want to see is where they're going after they're done nesting. 
Um, and what we found is we've got a lot of our species, our, a lot of our turtles that are heading down through the, the Florida Keys. Some of them hang out in the Keys. Some of them will head up into the nice green areas in Florida Bay here. We've got other animals that will go over to the, the Bahamas, the Caribbean. We've had some go down to Cuba. We had one that traveled in just a, about a month and a half, left South Florida, traveled over a thousand miles and ended up in Mexico. We've even had ones that have traveled up towards North, uh, all the way up to North Carolina um, and, and you know are foraging up in those regions. So if you guys are interested, if you can go to, you, you know, go anytime you want to turtletracking.org. Um, and this is our tracking site where you can actually follow our animals around as, um, you know, as we're learning about them, we update the site every day and you can see where the animals are going day to day as well. Uh, it's an amazing technology that allows us to look at the long term movements and really start to dial down and try to figure out ways that we can best protect these animals sort of in all the different stages of their life. So we know, obviously, the Broward County Sea Turtle Conservation Program has been working for many years to protect them on the nesting beach, to protect those nests from, you know, getting run over by tractors, things like that. Um, but once they get back out in the water with these movements, we can start to maybe look at things like marine protected areas. You know, the, the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary is wonderful because it limits certain activities in those areas. But... When we're starting to look at movements, are there areas that we should maybe add to that list, maybe where we don't have fishing or you know have minimal boating or something like that, in areas where we've got a lot of turtles around or at certain times of year to help protect these guys in their environment as they're out there feeding and, and moving around as well. So it's very exciting. And this is something that's coming together. And we're, we're very excited to, to kind of keep watching where they're going, learning about the different areas where they're traveling. Um, Glenn has done, again, some amazing work um, in sort of putting these guys on the map. These satellite tags have been used in other areas, but nothing's ever been done in this area. And we're at such a unique location, sort of the bottom of the Florida Peninsula here, that our animals can travel in lots of different directions, where in other parts of the state, they might only go to one or two places, where ours have a much more sort of diverse area that they can travel as they're leaving the nesting beaches. So um, definitely keep an eye out and over time, we'll be able to, you know, hopefully put these guys on the map a little bit more, but definitely check out the turtletracking.org. Um, you know, if people are interested, there are ways to sponsor turtles and things like that. You can name the turtles on our site to be able to follow, you know, your turtle around as we're moving. Um, so what are some of the ways that you can help? So that's always you know, one of the things we love to end with. There's a lot of things that you can do as an individual um, that can help not only sea turtles, but all these different marine, you know, marine life in the areas. One of the biggest ones is keep our beaches and waterways free of trash. You know, The Extra Catch is a phenomenal group here in South Florida that started up. And you know, sort of their idea is when you're out there on the beach or you're you know, on the water, swimming, snorkeling, diving, fishing, it doesn't take anything to pick up that piece of trash that you see floating and bring it back, back with you. That is your extra catch. You're picking up that trash, taking it out of the water and taking it home. Um, you know, those always use your reusable bags and recycle. Those plastic bags that you get from, you know, Publix or Winn-Dixie or something like that, you throw them away. If they get out of the water, they look exactly like a jellyfish. And so sea turtles, whales, all these different animals are eating these and you know, it can actually fill up their stomachs, they can choke on it. All these things are very, very bad for our waters and our, our animals there. Please never, never, never release balloons on purpose. Um, I know it might look really cool to have them all floating away, but everything that goes up must come down. And many of these end up in the water. And again, just like that plastic bag, those balloons look exactly like a jellyfish or something like that. Um, in the water, they get eaten, they can strangle and, and, and do a lot of damage to our environment as well as the animals. Um, if you guys are out at night and you happen to see a mom coming up on the beach, the biggest thing I ask is enjoy it, but please do so from a distance. Do not ever disturb that mom. Um, you could imagine if, if you're maybe trying to, try to have a baby, you don't want 100 people running in and taking your picture while you're trying to have a baby, right? So these guys don't want to do that either. Uh, let them be, stay back, be very quiet, keep your lights off, um, and just enjoy what you're able to see um, with these animals as they're laying their nests. 
they'll head back, um, you know, and again, hopefully a couple months later, a lot of those babies will head down to the water. Um, if you do live near or have a business or anything near the, the, the beach, you want to try to minimize your lighting. Um, there are many things that we can do with our lighting to make it more sea turtle and wildlife friendly. Um, you can keep a, a longer wavelength, which means the amber color or red um, sort of light colors are ones that don't impact the sea turtles and other animals nearly as much as, say, a bright white light. Uh, you can keep your lights lower to the ground and very focused on just the areas where that light needs to be. Something like a big globe that sends out this big white bunch of light everywhere does a huge amount of damage. You're lighting things that don't need light to begin with. And they're very, very bright and can really mess with these different animals. Um, you know, and even things like keeping your blind shuts. Obviously, you're not going to have your house with no lights on all through sea turtle season. But if you keep the blind shut at night, you can really lessen the impact that the beach sees uh, with that lighting. Um, be very alert when you're boating. Um, these animals have to come to the surface to breathe. So you always want to be very cautious and you know, very aware as you're driving around so that if one does pop in front of your boat, you can move around it without hitting it um, as you're moving. Um, everybody loves to dig a big hole in the sand. Do they like to big sand, build sand castles, things like that? Dig away, build away, but when you leave, fill that hole in, knock your sand castle down, because what happens if a sea turtle comes up at night, they might fall in that great big hole that you left on the beach and they won't be able to get out. Or a, you can imagine a little hatchling that's this big, they come up to your beautiful sandcastle, it's going to be like running into Fort Knox. They're not going to be able to know where to go to the water, they'll get stuck in, the, in your sandcastles, things like that. So you always want to make sure you leave the, the sand nice and smooth and clean, uh, just the way you found it when you got there. So with that, uh, I think we've got a little bit of time. I would love to try to answer any questions that you have um, about sea turtles, or I can try to answer anything else. but <laughs> we'll see what we get. All right, thank you. And uh, we can stop just so anybody has any questions for Dr. Derek Burkholder. Uh, now is the time to get those uh, in. We've got a couple to start with here. Uh, so just to begin with, uh, Kiefer's got a great question and I'm really curious to know about this too. Um, what's the farthest you've ever tracked any sea turtle uh, from a tag that you've put on in South Florida? What's like the farthest or most unexpected place you've ever found uh, one of your turtles? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So I the think that the furthest just like individual movement was that one that went to the Yucatan to Mexico. Um, it was about 1200 miles and I think right around six weeks or so from the time it left the beaches to, to getting to Mexico. So it was a pretty impressive swim. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so that's, yeah, that one's been pretty good. The North Carolina turtle also had a pretty, pretty um, spectacular swim getting up there. Um, so it's good to see. I know, I've, I know I've seen tracking data uh, going uh, into almost like close to like Bermuda and up to the Northern Atlantic. Uh, are those uh, turtles that you might not typically be studying? Is that a different species or is there, uh, or is that just an anomaly or coming from somewhere? No, yeah, that's a great question. And so the, the animals that we've been focusing on so far with our program has been the green and log red turtles. Mm -hmm. um, many of our green turtles, um, you know, they're again, feeding on mostly those seagrass analogies. We found most of those guys are going down towards the, the um, Florida Bay, the, the Keys, things like that. And Marquesas is a, seems to be a big, um, feeding ground for them. The loggerheads, we have a little bit more of a diverse movement. So those ones to North Carolina, the Bahamas, Caribbean, Mexico, uh, Cuba. But I think the ones that you're thinking about are going to be the leatherbacks. Um, those are the largest species. They're much more pelagic. And actually, um, there's a phenomenal group here in South Florida called Florida Leatherbacks. Um, incorporated. There's a nonprofit that's been working up in the Martin County area, so a little bit further north of here, but where there's, you know, some of the densest, well, probably the densest nesting leatherback nesting in Florida. Um, and they've been studying that um, population for about 20 years now, and they've done a, some amazing satellite tracking work with them. And they've had them travel all the way up to Canada, um, like you said, out towards Bermuda, some of these big wide, wide ranging movements. Um, they definitely travel much further than any of the, the loggerheads or greens that we've had tagged so far. Um, a lot of them will travel up to the Carolinas, but again, 
even further north than that, all the way up. They have them and go all the way up to Canada as well. So, yeah. And you mentioned uh, it was a uh, also great to see the the numbers from this year already. I know that in the past that's been uh, difficult to find uh, this uh, close out from the season. Uh, yeah. But with leatherback numbers looking good. Uh, and I remember early in the season when we usually see more leatherbacks, uh, seeing more uh, nests there. And some of the nests are of what I, and I'm not an expert at reading the uh, labels or anything like that, but there was one nest at my, it was, it was kind of on my spot at the beach. So I noticed it pretty well. A very big leatherback nest that went yep. almost from like one lifeguard, the marking anyways, went almost from like one lifeguard stand to another on Pompano Beach. Is gotcha. there because they're so rare, is there extra markings or are the nests uh, just a lot bigger because they're so much bigger? That's a good question. So there's um, one of the things I think you were maybe looking at is that we had an area that we um, had fenced off in Pompano, it was near the pier there, yeah. um, that was fenced off this year because we had uh, a nesting bird colony Oh. Um, in the area. And so there was a huge area that was fenced off for that. But in general, leatherback nests um, in this area are much, much larger roped off areas because they're very, very good at camouflaging their mm -hmm. nests. And so all of them will kind of bury and dig, you know, will we'll dig their nests, lay their eggs, cover it up, and then they try to camouflage it a little bit. Um, for the, the greens and loggerheads, it's a much more contained area where leatherbacks will throw sand sometimes 15, 20 feet in every direction. Um, and their eggs can be anywhere within that spray area of the sand. So it's much more difficult to know where the eggs are. So that's why we, we sort of rope off the whole spray area just to make sure that we're protecting those eggs wherever they are in that, in that area. Right on. Uh... So getting into some more audience questions, Dermot wants to know uh, what the relationship between uh, your program and US FWC is. Great question. Yeah, so FWC has got the monumental task of protecting these animals in Florida. And so all of the work that's done with sea turtles statewide is done um, first by obtaining marine turtle permits from FWC. And so any work that goes on, whether it's monitoring to research to, you know, anything going on, you know, the, the rehab, rehabilitation, any of that kind of stuff that deals with the sea turtle has a marine turtle permit um, from FWC. And so they make sure that people are using all the, the best techniques. Um, they're, you know, doing everything as safely and healthily, healthily as possible. They want to make sure any research that's being done is being done in a way that minimizes um, impacts to these endangered species, things like that. So we work very closely with FWC um, to make sure that we're doing things properly. We are doing so with you know the proper permits. And then obviously we do send all of our data as well as every other permitted person in Florida sends their data to FWC and they compile statewide information about what's going on with our turtle populations um, in Florida each year. Good question. Very good. Uh, question from Marlo and Deb, uh, longtime listeners, first time callers. Uh, are turtles, are the turtles you work with mostly solitary or do any, uh, uh, what, are, what are the social lives of those, those turtles, I guess? Yeah, great question. So in general, sea turtles are pretty solitary animals. Um, they don't really, you know, when, when mom lays those eggs on the beach, that's the last time she sees those eggs. She, she heads back out and does her things. Those babies hatch. They're on their own right from day one. Um, so there are areas that these turtles might congregate. For the babies, they're going to head out to those big sargassum, the seaweed patches floating at the surface. And that's what is going to be a nice protective area, a place where they can find food. Um, they can sort of move around and, and they'll follow those and sort of ride with those on the ocean currents for many, many years. So they might, animals might congregate in those areas, but they are pretty solitary. As an adult, again, they're going to come back and they, they sort of do their own thing. Um, there might be very good resources, you know, food areas where a really good patch of seagrass where you might see a few turtles around that are in the same area, but they're not really hanging out with one another. They are a very solitary species. That's why Captain, right now, uh, we do only have Captain, our green sea turtle at the Meek. Um, she's by herself, but again, doesn't really impact her at all because she's not 
you know, looking for a family group. She's not like living in a pot of dolphins or whales or something like that. They are solitary out in the wild. So being solitary in, in the pool here at the Meek is, is not a big problem for her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's also, uh, just to address our audience on the call, that's also a comment or a question I get from visitors here at MODS a lot. We have our own uh, resident uh, loggerhead sea turtle, uh, yep. Gigi, uh, Georgia. Uh, and I also get asked a lot, uh, why isn't there anything in the tank? Because we'll see maybe the freshwater turtles, and there's a lot of them in there, and like stuff to climb on, play on. Sea turtles, as we've hopefully learned tonight, are a completely different uh, type of uh, lifestyle. And so uh, that's to rehabilitate them to prepare them for that kind of solitary life in the ocean. Uh, speaking of which, a uh, question from Kiefer, a uh, big fan, some big fans of Captain on the call tonight, uh, just asking uh, how, how Captain's doing, if there's anything uh, new with Captain uh, since the meek has been closed. Yeah, great question. Kiefer, we definitely look forward to seeing you back here and everybody else. Um, Captain is doing wonderful. Uh, she's definitely missing all of her fans. She's, um, she's a ham, so she loves when people are around. Um, but she's doing very well. Um, she, she, her, her house got spruced up during the shutdown here. She got a new paint job on the pool. Um, we're actually in the process right now of trying to find another sea turtle to join her. Um, and so we're working with FWC right now to try to find another animal to add to her tank. So that'll be a big, um, exciting addition when we're you know, hopefully in the very near future. Um, and we've actually put together some new exhibits and things over um, during our shutdown as well. So we're, we're very excited, hopefully in the new year to get everybody back and see, see what we've been doing. So. Excellent. Looking forward to coming back to the Meek. Uh, got time for a couple more questions here. Uh, this one's from Matt. Uh, it says, uh, this is actually a really interesting question. Uh, so what are the, <laughs> I'm we can talk about the sea turtle rodeo also, but uh, <laughs> this I think is this I think is referring to the turtles themselves and not the uh, rodeo hands. Uh, you, what are the surface to dive time ratios uh, of some of the sea turtles? Um, like yeah. how long can they stay under? How deep can they go? Is it vary for different species? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. And so obviously these animals are air breathing, so they do have to come to the surface to breathe. Um, but they do have some pretty impressive um, ability to hold their breath and stay down for quite a while. Um, so if, an, if, if these guys are active, moving around, feeding, things like that, looking for food, usually, you know, again, depending on the species, the, the, the temperature of water, um, you know, where they are, how deep they are, things like that. They're usually looking at about a 10 to 15 minute window where they're going to be diving, moving around a lot where they'll pop up, grab another breath and go back down and move around. But if they're going to be down and just resting, usually what they do is they try to find a little bit deeper area um, where they're maybe not quite so buoyant or, try, you know, their body's not trying to float quite so much to the surface. Or you might see them kind of wedged in underneath a coral or something like that on the coral reef, and they're just going to take a nap. And so if they're doing that where they're not moving around or not trying to swim or anything like that, a resting dive can be anywhere from two, three, four hours. They've been recorded up to over seven hours on a single breath if they're just napping and hanging out. Um, you know, one cool thing about the leatherbacks, again, the biggest of all the species, but they've um, developed perfectly to go after uh, jellyfish as their main food source. So even though they're 1,500 or 2,000 pounds, they're, feeding, they're, they're growing to that size just on jellyfish. And so... Many times they're going after some of the bigger guys, um, something called, there's one species of jellyfish called the lion mane jelly um, that can get huge, but generally they live in quite deep water. And so the leatherbacks can actually dive to very, very deep depths. And that's actually one of the reasons they have that leathery shell instead of the hard bony shell is um, they can actually dive down to over a thousand meters. So over 3000 feet below the surface to look for these jellyfish. So they'll take that big breath. Um, they've actually developed a way that they can, you know, take a big full lung of air. Um, they can actually push the oxygen and, you know, that air sort of in their, um, they can push the oxygen into their bloodstream, into their tissues, and then they'll actually let go. They exhale, they push all the air out of their lungs. So they don't have to fight that big bubble of air as they're diving to 3000 feet below the surface but they can use the oxygen that's in their tissues and things like that before coming back up to take another big breath. So they're amazing animals and their body with that leathery 
um, shell and those lines down sort of the way their bones are, their body can actually compress when they get to those really deep depths. There's a lot of pressure down there. Um, you know, if you were to send a, a styrofoam cup um, with all those little air bubbles that make up a styrofoam cup, if it started off this big at the surface, it would be probably this big when it got down to 3,000 feet. So it squishes all that air down. Um, the, the leatherback's the same way. It can kind of compress, and then it will, you know, kind of come back to its full size as it gets up to the surface. So pretty impressive animals. Nice. Great well, question. Yeah, that's quite, yeah, that is something I've always wondered, too. Uh, all right, I think we got time for one more question, uh, and this is a good one because we can tie it into responsible citizenship here, uh, but this is kind of the other side of that. Uh, what do you do, this is from Victoria, what do you do when you get a call uh, that a turtle's in need of rescue? Uh, what typically happens to the turtle from your end? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and so we've got our, um, our, our program monitors a sea turtle emergency line. Um, and so if I can actually, I'll put it in the chat here before I go. Mm -hmm. um, but that number, we monitor it 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. If anybody calls us, if they see a dead, sick, injured sea turtle, um, we will respond. So we will send somebody out when we get the call um, and we will go and we will assess the animal. If it's a dead animal, we will document any injuries, anything we see on it. Um, you know, in some cases, we'll take that, that you know, the, the animal back with us to try to figure out. We, we'll do something called a necropsy. Uh, which is just like, you know, kind of an autopsy on a, on a person, but we try to figure out what maybe killed that animal. Um, if it's a live animal, um, we coordinate with Florida Fish and Wildlife very closely, and we take it to one of those rehab centers. Um, for us, that's usually going to be um, maybe the um, Gumbo Limbo Nature Center in Boca, or down to, um, you know, maybe down to the Keys, depending on what injuries or things it has down to the... Um, the sea turtle hospital in the keys or down to miami sea aquarium things like that we again we coordinate everything with fwc because they know who's got space what kind of animals that they can take and they've got the vets and the staff that will take care of any injuries that they have once they get there so we transport those animals 24 hours a day to the to wherever they need to go to get the help they need good question Excellent. good good call and yeah uh just a reminder of that number so we can let everybody know what to yep. happen i'm gonna Put it in the chat right now. Because that's good info. Really, really important to let somebody who knows what they're doing uh, handle the sea turtle. Uh, best to just wait uh, for the right hands to come along. So uh, while we're getting that up and running, um, that number is 954-328-0580. Uh, and there are probably some uh, resources for you available on the signage along the beach, too, if you're not sure, if you don't have time to bookmark Absolutely. that now. That number is uh, on those signs as well. Check for the signs about uh, sea turtle nesting uh, or on the labels of what to do if you see a, a stressed sea turtle. Uh, but just to look out for its best interest, you want to call uh, somebody like Derek instead. Uh, so that's all the time we have. Thank you for your questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Derek, for joining us uh, once again. Always a pleasure. Uh, looking forward to getting back down to the Meek uh, once it reopens in the new year. Uh, you can, in the meantime, come down to Mods and check things out. Uh, thanks again to the Save Our Seas Foundation for making this series possible. Uh, we'll be starting this up again in the new year, hopefully. And thank you all for uh, tuning in. Uh, it's been a great uh, year of this series, and uh, hopefully to see you again uh, in the future and to other events in the meantime. Uh, so. Yeah. Everybody have a wonderful night. Uh, my name is Brady Newbill signing off at the Museum of Discovery and Science. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.